Next up, we're going to have a panel discussion, and this is going to be uh, quite interesting. The panel subject is uh, building a resilient food system in the time of climate change, and we have uh, quite a collection of um, food system people to talk about that. First is Jesse Cook. Jesse's a vice president at Ulupono Initiative, where he provides financial and technical due diligence for investment decisions on various projects. And his focus at Ulupono is working on how to increase local food production in the islands. Next is Hunter Hevelin, who's a political agroecologist for sustainable food system transitions. His uh, firm is Super Subsistence. Super Sistence. Okay. <laughs> Super Subsistence, yes. He's an advocacy director of the Hawaii Farmers Union. N. Young is director of sustainable industry development at Kamehameha Schools. And N has held. Uh, former positions as the dire executive director of the Food Basket, general manager of Sensei Farms Lanai, and most re recently executive director of Pacific Gateway Center. Claire Sullivan is CEO of FarmLink, a social enterprise on a mission to transform local, local food production into a thriving industry and make good local food accessible to all people. She pre previously worked at Ma'o Organic Farm in Waianae and spent 10 years working for Whole Foods. And finally, the moderator for the panel is Lisa Kleisner. Lisa co-founded and chairs the board of KL Felicitas Foundation, an impact fund, and also Hawaii Investment Ready, which is an, a local accelerator. Lisa is also a member of the investment committee of Aquaspark, the Netherlands-based global aquaculture fund. Lisa was principal of the Kleisner Group, a multidiscipline consultancy in architecture that worked in uh, technology and biotech startups in Silicon Valley. So if we can convene all those folks up here, we'll have a really interesting discussion on food systems in time of climate change. Are you gonna stand here and do that? Okay, uh, I don't think there's any slides or? Aloha mai kako. Aloha. It's very late today, and we've all been sitting around, so I, we're going to just tap, pick up the pace a little bit, okay? Um, <laughs> woo. Um, I am so honored today to be here on the stage and have these amazing people to my right that I've been working with over the last 10 years. I'm a graduate of the Kamehameha Schools and UH Manua U, uh, School of Architecture. Um, I reinvented myself, obviously, because I'm not doing that anymore. But architecture played a key role in understanding systems. And every one of the people to my right is working in a critical part of the food system in Hawaii. And they're going to be sharing a little bit on their perspective today. So, and because I can't resist, I want to, first of all, mahalo Jason and Jim for even thinking this up and then pulling it off. It's no small task. So please give them a round of applause. So I was really inspired, I don't know about you, when Governor Green got up there and he said, aligning technology policy and land resource, and I'm, I am very much generalizing what he said or compacting it in my own way, of the, and land management with a shared vision that when we do that and we align that, that we can enable resources we have um, by addressing the risks head on to thrive in Hawaii. And that's not just ag. Really, it is uh, these critical pieces of our environmental infrastructure 
impacts so much more. And I think all of you are feeling that with what's happened in Lahaina. So um, John then talked about turning vulnerabilities like drought into an opportunity. And that got me thinking, um, what are the things that we can change? Well, Shanoa talked about the lack of ease of doing business, and so I looked it up while we were here. Hawaii is 49th of 50 in ease of business, and it's like golf. It's not good to have a high score, okay? <laughs> Every conference needs a joke. Um, but it's no joke. It's not easy to do business in Hawaii. I know, I work with entrepreneurs, and they have hard times getting permits to do what they need to do. It's a real struggle. Um, also, Rebecca White underscored it when she said, quote and unquote, Hawaii has an interesting business and regulatory environment. <laughs> interesting, right? And then George, he says, very matter-of-factly, ag is massively underinvested based on GDP. Uh-huh. And then he said, you reap what you sow. Well, we're all voters, aren't we? So, and then it was a little uplifting, I think, with Isaiah and Mike. They talked about the reticence of farmers to adopt technology, trust being an issue, right? Both of them touched on that. What's uplifting about that? Um, someone also talked about how we can provide uh, services back to these farmers on technology to help lift them up and provide and move them along and not just leave them to figure it out on their own. And then we had Jill, plenty. I love the name of that company. A vertical indoor farm that by thinking outside the box, innovated by putting egg into a box in vertical farms. I thought that was quite clever. And she then articulated three issues that drove them to their business. Climate, food security, and labor. And that plays a big role here in Hawaii too. So what I'm hearing is even, no matter how far flung a speaker is, the issues they're bringing up are universal in ag around the world. So um, system level statewide climate impacts are real in Hawaii. Droughts, floods, wildfires are, are increasing and becoming more destructive. Wildfire alone increased fourfold in the last two decades in Hawaii. And I think of those of you who have lost anything to fire, uh, I lost uh, quite a bit, I lost a lot of structures on our property to fire. It is permanent in some ways. That permanent in the way it impacts you and permanent in the way it impacts your property and the economy. So sadly, the, the loss of life and the resulting impacts from uh, economic impacts from the Lahaina fire are just the tip of the climate change sphere, just the tip of it. 94% of communities in Hawaii are in the WUI designated areas, wildland urban interface. What does that mean? They are in the same position that Lahaina is, that if a fire happens, that community could be wiped out. 94%. Ag can play a role, actually, though, in mitigating that. And hopefully, Anne will touch on that a little bit. Um, so we're going to start with Claire. So Claire, you've been working in food systems, as beautifully described by Jim. Could you share with us a little bit about your role, why you're doing what you do, and then how you believe we can achieve resilience in ag? That's like five questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> you have to remind me, just get to the next one. Aloha, everybody. I'm Claire Sullivan, currently CEO of FarmLink Hawaii, which is an online grocer of 100% locally grown, ranched, and made groceries. Uh, we deliver island-wide on Oahu. We source statewide. I've been in Hawaii's food system for 20 years, spanning the gamut from Maui land and pine in the early days of hope for finding a post-plantation diversified model that would work, which did not materialize, uh, through 10 years at Whole Foods Mar Market and building local sourcing with about 300 producers. Um, and that program has since waned considerably uh, since the acquisition by Amazon and much more centralization of purchasing. And then a few years at Ma'o Organic Farms, uh, which for me was regrounding in community and remembering how we could solve our own problems rather than turning to outside partners like Whole Foods or Amazon to solve for us. But then while I was there, seeing that we were still stuck in this impasse between too much demand and too little supply, which had been plaguing our food system 
for the whole time and that I'd been in it and much before, and that we weren't finding our path from the plantation system and all of its significant challenges, but also the fact that it was very productive. We had not found our way to a new model and that we kept waiting for producers to grow more food. And we were putting all the risk on them and saying, well, we're here, we're ready to buy it, why aren't you producing it? And that hasn't gotten us anywhere. We continue to be stuck, um, putting just these tremendous barriers um, in front of those small scale producers and wondering why can't they scale those walls all by themselves. So I chose to go back into the retail environment because I see just this tremendous opportunity as a buyer, an activist buyer, to be a better partner for producers in scaling their businesses in accessing markets and shouldering some of the risk alongside them so we're not waiting on the sidelines uh, for them to do everything and then us just to get to capture the sale. Uh, when I think about climate change and food systems and food production, I think about vulnerability, I think about volatility and unpredictability. Um, and you know, we're experiencing that in many ways, from wildfire to drought to increased disease pet pressure and pest pressure, obviously the potential for big hurricanes and, and their impact. So when we're faced with that kind of environment, it seems to me that finding our sources of stability and resilience is the most important step that we can take collectively as a community. And to do that, I think if there were one idea that I would want to share today, which Lisa asked us to do, it's the idea of diversity and the strength that comes in diversity in all of its forms um, and that we are vulnerable when we rely on one solution in any space. And in the, in the space of agriculture, we can think about diversity on a whole bunch of different facets from geography to the crops themselves, to production methodologies, to scale or size of production, to the business models and ownership structures, the products and services across the value chain, and even what we're doing with food once it's harvested, its preservation. So I think that our answer lies in many, many answers, a multitude of answers across each of those spaces where we're leaning into the resilience that comes from having different approaches and different solutions applied in each of those areas. For example, with geography, that we're doing production across the Pai Aina, so when drought is localized, we can turn to another source. This is obvious, this is, it's kind of obvious, but I, I think we can get so stuck on finding a silver bullet or a panacea that we don't remember that it's actually in complexity that we find our strength. For crops, it's about variety that's within a single farm, that's even within a single crop, that we have multiple varietals, just again, the resilience of diversification. For the size of um, producers, if we were reliant on a single producer, and I'm very grateful to the large producers like Mahi Pono that are growing a lot of food, also serving an important role in protecting community by keeping it active in use and irrigated, uh, but that's, that's vulnerable, right? What happens if your sole operator chooses no longer to operate? And we've experienced that with the demise of the plantation structure. And we were reliant on them for maintaining our irrigation systems, et cetera. So if we're reliant on too few actors, again, we have a vulnerability. So wanting to go across, across scale. We could go down each one of those. I don't think there's okay. time to do so. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna just pick that up, diversity. Um, and I think that this is something that often, to your point, here in Hawaii, we think more narrowly and we don't think about policy that can, instead of serving a narrow mandate, actually could, could serve a broader mandate. So that actually leads to land management. And, and you've been involved in, as uh, Jim covered so well, in three very different types of positions uh, having to do with production. One, um, food bank where you were actually quite an innovator looking to uh, execute fresh uh, food contracts, right, to service uh, the population on Hawaii instead of just canned food. So it was, he came into the HIR um, accelerator uh, back in, I think it was the second group, and uh, it was really struck how innovative he is. And then you went on to work with, uh, on Lanai, on, uh, with Sensei, very different, very uh, more technology, high tech, and then now you're currently at the Kamehameha Schools. So I'm just curious what you're, you know, kind of viewing that over the scan of your career over the last decade or so, what are your impressions around how 
what we can do differently to, be, to help ag become more resilient to climate change. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm lucky that Claire is smarter than me, so she's already kind of uh, said what uh, my big idea is as well. Uh, but I think I'm coming at it from a, uh, from, from a people lens as, as far as uh, diversity uh, is, is, is concerned. Um, you know, I thought this was earth shattering when we were talking uh, last week, but I've actually heard it in every presentation so far, which is that, you know, AI tech, all these things, you know, they serve the vision, right? And so in order for us to get to what resiliency is, we have to have a strong idea of what resiliency means uh, for each of us, as, as what Claire uh, was saying, you know, from, from a, di a diverse set of experiences. And so, um, you know, fortunate enough to work at um, uh, the Food Basket, Hawaii Islands uh, Food Bank, where, you know, we dealt with people that had socioeconomic challenges, you know, and so for them, what does diversity look like? You know, they're thinking on a very short timeline. You know, how can I get fed today? Where am I going to find, you know, my, my next meal? How am I going to take care of my kids? And that's a very different resiliency question from uh, uh, Sensei Farms, you know, which um, was funded by, I won't name names, but he owns a little bit of land on, on Anai. Uh, you know, the resiliency thought there is, you know, how do I get fresh lettuce every day, you know, of, of the year? That, that's, that's the same quality, that's the same um, uh, amount, that's the same nutrition, right? That's a very different resiliency question based, based on your socioeconomic status. Uh, and then for us, at, uh, now in my role at uh, Kamehameha Schools, you know, we're looking at uh, kind of modernizing the ahupua'a system, right? So, so one unfortunate side effect, I think, well, among many, uh, of, of climate change, you know, at least from my perspective in, in, in a cultural lens, is that, you know, we, we hearken back a lot to the Aupua system and, and what it meant, right? Well, and that system was built around uh, the environment that they had. And, you know, I'll say that that environment is, uh, you know, as a result of climate change, among other things, it, it, it's just not there anymore. You know, in addition to the, the natural environment, we also now have an overlay of, of a built environment on top of that, right? We have commercial properties, we have industrial properties, uh, and ag has to play a role uh, amidst all, all of that, which it can. You know, we've heard from uh, vertical farming plenty, for example, uh, uh, today. Uh, but that means that, you know, we do have to modernize what that looks like. And, and for us, uh, you know, we'll give in the Lahaina example, right? You know, if up Malka was forested, or, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard, but, um, you know, Lahaina used to be more of a greenscape, you know, with, with ulu trees and, and all sorts of other things. Now, can we go back to that? Pro probably not. But again, I think it's about kind of looking at your uh, idea of re resiliency and then seeing what's possible uh, within what the, what the environment can, uh, can, can provide. Mahalo, Ann. So we're going to keep on the theme of land uh, and use and um, re kind of maybe even rethinking boundaries uh, if, if we need to. So I'm going to have actually Jess and um, Hunter to have a conversation about it. They come from two different directions. Uh, Jesse is an investor in food systems and Hunter is a researcher in food systems. So uh, I don't know which of you wants to go first. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. You know, my, my concern with climate change is how do you pay for all of this, right? We are going to have less rain. It's going to be hotter. There's going to be more times of drought. So we have these large ag water systems that were built by the plantations a century ago. Um, and we were actually blessed with that because to replace these systems would cost billions of dollars. But the issue is... You know, as we get droughts and things like that, we need to maintain and repair these systems, and it's going to cost tens of millions of dollars, but that's a lot better than trying to replace these systems once they're totally in disrepair, which would be billions of dollars. So Hawaii has this issue where we have to deal with climate change, but who's going to bear the brunt of it? Is it going to be the taxpayer? Uh, 
you know, there are a lot of federal programs and Hawaii hasn't been as proactive to go after federal grants that can fund some of these climate change impacts that we need to be more aggressive about as a state. Um, one of these grants is the Community Wildfire Defense Grant. Uh, it's a new program. Uh, last year, California got $93 million from this program and Hawaii got $400,000. So we need to figure out how we're going to fund these things, who's going to fund it, um, and, and hopefully mitigate that impact to most of our taxpayers. By the way, Jesse was on the front page, no, on an inside spread of Hawaii business, I think, <laughs> um, talking about the federal capital that he's been able to bring into Hawaii by providing grant monies for uh, grant writers. And it's not insignificant, actually. Thank you for that. Well, I've, I've approached the food system in a lot of different ways over my career within it and have had the opportunity to actually work with, with everybody in, in different capacities. And so I thought I might share a few, few of the ways, at least from my own evolving understanding of how we can approach the agri-food system and its resilience building that I've kind of grappled with over the past decade. And I think starting really at the, at the farm scale, thinking about the, the, like who we're functionally talking about in terms of building agro-ecosystem resilience is that we need to be really thinking about what multi-hazard food production systems look like. So really at, a, at the, the scale of the, the field or the, the parcel, what are the practices, the activities that could be adopted by producers? And there's some actually some enabling technology we've wrapped about um, to try and facilitate decision support for farmers that could help better understand the types of hazards and the types of crops and conceivably the types of conservation practices, all of which have different funding pathways and different, uh, we could say, barriers and maybe enabling opportunities to really transform the way we think about how we're, we're managing at the farm level, at the field level. As we scale up from that, um, some, and that was kind of stuff I was grappling with, say, in 2013 or so, uh, trying to automate some of my own kind of design work. Um, 2015 and, and later was then really thinking a little bit more about some of the, the regional scale. So what does that look like in terms of multifunctional land use planning and starting to incorporate some climate modeling. So I had a position within the university where we were modeling the crop suitability changes as a result of climate change um, for dozens of crops and could easily do so for uh, hundreds. And thinking then about if we can understand the, the, the areas where we have a long-term suitability for a large variety of crops that there would conceivably be, if we were taking a rational approach, implications for our land use planning, then, right? Maybe that's the type of land we'd want to start prioritizing in terms of our, our protections or ensuring that it's um, going to be functional for a long time. And if we take that a little bit broader, um, kind of what I grapple with now in terms of a, my, my work as a advocacy director with the Farmers Union or as a consultant with a project with the state looking at how we regulate our agricultural lands through soil classification is that we really need to be focused on enabling policies, right? And so taking that old chestnut of kind of what, what we regulate uh, is kind of what, what we as a society value. If you want to know what a, a society really values, look at their tax code, um, which of course everyone loves doing. Uh, but in digging into some of this for the state, really seeing that a lot of our ecosystem, our, our primary regulatory mechanisms for agricultural land are based off of production alone of agricultural output. And that production measure is, in many cases, was created in the late 60s using data that was released in the mid-50s that was collected in the mid-30s and based off of irrigation infrastructure that was last kept up to date in the maybe say mid 90s, if we're you know, being generous about keeping it up. And so really there's a pressing need uh, to update some of these systems, right? To be incorporating some of these climate models and really more broadly we could say ecosystem services into our regulatory structures. So right now when we think about agri reg agricultural land regulation, it is how many calories could we conceivably, or could, and we of course being the we of 1960, produce on this land, as opposed to also considering the manifold benefits that could come from good land management and good agricultural land management. And then we can start considering things like hydrological function, fire breaks, view planes, cultural value, the whole gamut 
Um, and so I think the, the policy space is ripe, and I would say looking historically at the way that crises serve to motivate significant changes in our land regulation systems, namely concerns about loss of uh, freshwater quantity in the late 18 and early 1900s that led to our forest reserve program, right? So we let uh, these crises animate and galvanize our interest in taking big, big changes to the way that we address um, land management. And I'm hoping that this uh, period, both of climate change, acute, chronic, and what lies ahead, um, will also be a, an opportunity for us to adopt some of these newer approaches. Thanks. Beautifully put, Hunter. Um, Jesse, as an investor, what, what he just laid out there is really laying a map out of the risk that um, an investor would face going into doing anything in ag. Do you, would you mind just sharing a little bit about what that looks like, the difficulty uh, that you see, and maybe some opportunities that you also see in investing in ag in Hawaii? I mean, yeah, agriculture has been slowly declining in Hawaii for decades now. Um, in the last ag census, I think 56% of ag operations were, had a net loss. So it's very, very challenging to find good agricultural business models right now. And Hawaii's at a disadvantage. We're small. Uh, you're competing with farms on the mainland that are thousands of acres, and that's normal. Uh, Hawaii's uh, average farm is one-third the size of California, probably less for Texas as well. Um, so it's tough to find economies of scale in Hawaii agriculture. So as an investor, it's very hard to find something that's going to make you a millionaire overnight or something like that. It's just not possible. So what we found, you know, going through this process of investing in Hawaii agriculture is that our money alone isn't going to do it. So we've been focusing on figuring out how to bring money into the system. So, uh, you know, we've had, we fund three grant writer programs and we helped out with a couple very large grants. So these three grant writer programs brought in $60 million in the last 10 years. Um, and then we also helped with grant writing efforts for the Climate Smart Commodities Grant, which was $40 million, and the Regional Food Business Center, which was $30 million. So grant writing and going after these federal money, that return on investment is much, much higher, and it helps out the overall system. And so what, the reason I asked that question is um, technology policy and land use management isn't enough. We need the right kind of capital to invest across those, those needs in the space. Uh, and it has to be not just um, venture capital, but it needs to be right debt that's aligned with the growing cycles of crops. It needs to be grants that are, are focused on looking at the lever systems with, within the broader food system to fund nonprofit activities that are critical to um, fill in the gaps between the for-profits in the space. And a good example of that would be in processing. Um, so we're going to have a little time left over because we're only, we've got 15 more minutes, but I don't think we're going to use it. So I'm going to go right to, unless the two of you have anything else you want to add. No? Anyone here want to say anything else? You're good? Sam. He's next. Yes, he's up. So Sam was not introduced because Jim didn't know I was putting him on, this, on the panel today. <laughs> um, but, you know, Jim's easy. So, um, and so is Sam. So I know Sam for quite a few years. Uh, he is an amazing entrepreneur. He lives on the island of Maui. So he was right there. Uh, actually, he wasn't there. He happened to be away with his family on a family trip visiting relatives on the East Coast. But when I spoke to him about being on the panel, the first thing he said, of course, was his deep concern for what was happening on Maui with his neighbors and with the folks in Lahaina. Uh, Sam came into the Hawaii Investment Ready Accelerator. He was our first technology company. <laughs> we usually have very boots on the ground kind of orgs. So we were super excited that he came uh, and joined us. And what really struck me about him was when we interviewed him, he said, when I said, why are you doing this? He said, I'm doing this because I see the need and I want to provide a tool to make conservation and agriculture in Hawaii more, uh, improve it. I know that by giving people software that's easy to use, they'll be 
better able to see their business and to be able to make prudent business decisions. And so he, and in those days, he was still a little bit early in the product. Today, the product has gone a, a, quite a distance, and he's part of that grant that uh, Jesse just mentioned, the, the, the $40 million grant at UH. Um, his tool, his software tool, I think, believe, is going to be the thing that's going to be collecting the metrics, working with all the different companies. So um, I asked him to sit on this panel today and listen in, and he's been here all day listening. So I'd love you to opine a little bit about uh, the relationship that you see between the field, you know, farmers in the field, and you've worked with quite a few of them, the technology tool that you have, maybe some of those dif difficulties that you've experienced and the opportunities that you see uh, with technology, uh, and, and maybe uh, conclude this with hopefully an upside that all of us can take home with us when we leave the uh, hall today. Well, first, thank you, Lisa, for letting me crash the panel. Oh, by the way, his company is called Nerds. Yeah. NRDS, which is Natural Resource Data Management. No, Solutions. data systems. Solutions. Solutions. Yeah so, <laughs> yeah, so I have a software company called NRDS, Nerds, Natural Resource Data Solutions. And it's kind of like QuickBooks meets Google Earth. And um, I, I got into it because I was originally actually a, a, field, a field guy, right? So I, I spent a lot of time doing field biology. And I, then I kind of evolved into being a software, software guy. and. Um, you know, and, and what I see is, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges, well, well, I think we all kind of, a lot of us understand the benefits that farmers can, can get um, in terms of, um, you know, building resilience for, for climate change, in terms of decision making and collecting data, um, and especially, you know, breaking down silos as we diversify, as we have more and more small farmers, breaking down silos so we can pull data together to make make bigger decisions and you know the challenge is the challenge is you know getting people to use the stuff right and and finding you know right sizing it i look around the room i see some of our successes i see some of our our near misses you know of people that we've worked with and um you know i think one of the things we need to do is, is better build these these feedback loops right to get people to use the technology right it's about right sizing it you know collecting you know uh 40 gigs of LIDAR data might be too much for a small farmer. They might be able to benefit from the, the, the outputs of it, but they're not necessarily going to be able to deal with the data or have the time to deal with the data. Um, and uh, yeah, so in terms, of, um, <clears throat> in terms of getting people to use it, you know, building these feedback loops, and as, as Jesse was talking about these, these federal grants, a lot, a lot of what we find in getting people to use the software is essentially compliance, right? We've had a lot of success with, with farmers that might be they're, they're growing callo and they're also getting grants, so they need to report on those grants. So they're actually using the app to collect the data to report on their grants, but then also to collect their, their production data. And then that actually results in being able to better f um, time their fertilizer cycles, right? Or other projects where we're working with um, communities to build alert systems, right? Where where um, when streams come up or rain, you know, rain comes up, they can better, um, you know, figure out when they're going to get stuck on the other side of the bridge, and they can get their products out. Um, so you know, ultimately, I think it's a, all about kind of, you know, and, and also these incentive programs, right? So as Lisa mentioned, we're part of this climate smart commodities project, which is essentially an incentive project. So you know, hoping to better interface with farmers and get more feedback on how to better build our tool so they can better, better meet their needs, right? So, you know, less about the profit and more about, you know, the, the impact of, of getting people to use it and building those feedback um, loops. And then I think another really key, key piece of the puzzle is to, you know, provide that support that helps people to adopt the technology and maybe even actually do it for them almost, right? Like building that, that workforce. And you know, what we've found is what, if there's a champion in the organization or even a technical service provider that can come and like help get people dialed in, provide that feedback on what needs to change and, and really kind of pull it all together. Thank you, Sam. So this morning, uh, Senator Dela Cruz opened up the conference with a few slides. If anyone was here and remembers them, they were circles, right? 
circle, and then circle, and all these different things were around the circle. There's two concepts, really, in the systems world. The world right now that in ag is pretty much egocentric. That means we look at one deal at a time as an investor, right? We rarely look across the value chain and think downstream, upstream as an investor, how we are gonna invest and maybe not just invest in that company, but invest in downstream and upstream so that we're buffering uh, the risks, right? Um, the systems world wants us to be ecocentric. What does that mean? That means we put a shared vision in the middle of our map and around it we assemble all the actors in the space who can share that vision with us and we have our differences and we're bringing different skills and different types of capital and different needs that we have but nonetheless we can agree on that central vision and that's how systems work uh, can be successful. We have a long way to go in Hawaii to get there, but the work that I'm doing with Hawaii Investment Ready, and especially being able to work with the folks who are here on the stage gives me a lot of hope, and I hope today you take some hope away with you as well. So thank you so much.